OK. I'm going to educate you now. Please do. Basically, just after the war, yep. the Chinese who helped this country out were forcibly deported. And my father was one of them. What happened with your father, may I ask? Well, I didn't know much about him. Didn't know anything about him. I mean, I was born in 44, so I didn't see much of him. Didn't know anything about him. In any... Liverpool, by the sound of it. Oh, yeah. yeah oh, yes, in Liverpool. Yeah, well, he helped this country out. Yeah. Going to America to get all kinds of stuff and bringing it back and that. Oh, he's in the merch. Yeah. And then uh, he got deported, but it was kept a secret for 70, uh, for 50 years. There are a lot of people in this country who don't know nothing about it. It was over 50 years before we found out. I thought my father just left us. And it was only after they'd been married, I had a few kids, and I was told that he lives in Singapore, why don't you go over and see him? And I said, no, I don't want to go over and see him. I do want to go over and see him if he's done the runner. But it was only afterwards when I found out that um, this country had forced them out of the country. What you must remember, you know, the Chinese who had children here, just over 400 kids, and that's a bloody disgrace. And this country have accepted that it did happen. They have, but there's no apologies for any of us. Thanks for joining us for today's class. Some of the things we've explored is the idea of the way that empire could be quite contested. And when we explore documents right, uh, relating to the Second World War in particular, the British were looking for support. Um, many Chinese sailors served on merchant vessels, particularly traveling across the Atlantic. But what begins to happen then is that some of these Chinese sailors, perhaps not too surprisingly, begin to make a home for themselves in Liverpool. Hello, I'm Yvonne Foley. I'm the daughter of one of the Chinese seamen that was forced to leave the UK after the end of the war. This is your ship, it's here at this dock, be there and off you go. A lot of them didn't know until they got there that it was a one-way ticket. There's a table. Oh, thanks. Look at this, 68 to 72, When you and I were young. Yeah. Well, I'm young yet. No. Gosh. <laughs> you were thin then. I know, skinny. My hair. <laughs> you had hair. <laughs> that was, oh, God, in 1962. <laughs> I was born in Hull. But I was brought up in Liverpool, and then my mother married, and we went to live in a place called Toxteth. Mum constantly struggled. We were quite poor, but Dad would take us out, go to the park. And it was when I was about 11, and then that's when my mother said to me, you know your dad's not your dad. He's not your genetic father. Your, your real father that helped give birth to you was Chinese. Pardon? She said, well, he was Chinese, but he left. Mum never openly talked about it, so that's sort of how I found out. And over the time, as I was growing up, little snippets would come out in conversation. My genetic father came from Shanghai, and I never knew him. His name was Nan Young. When my father disappeared, my mother was heartbroken and still remembered him. It was obviously a love relationship. A lot of our mothers went to their death believing they'd been deserted. I 
I was then curious, uh, but not enough to investigate because I didn't feel that it was appropriate for me, and especially when I had a lovely dad, I wouldn't have insulted him. It wasn't until he was dead that you felt free to actually explore the story. It was 20 years ago, as I say, when we started to piece, piece it together. These are my working files, and when people contacted, give some information, passing on the information. We started researching this back in about 2000, and we'd heard a radio programme talking about men being shanghai So then we really set to and started researching. Very luckily, Charles had an academic background. We're on the internet at the National Archives. If it said Chinese, we'd order it. Can you look at this? Now, look. Again, the whole details. You've got a total here. 369 men. 369 men. Warwick University holds all the union files of the seal. When I started reading these papers, the overt racism that was in them, I didn't like it. But it gave us a good insight into what had taken place. It's really important for the Liverpool children to find out what happens to their fathers. This is not simply an academic question for a historian to pursue. This is a human question. These are children who've lost their fathers from a very, very young age. Why didn't he come back? What happened to him? Did he die? These are incredibly important questions at a human level. Charles is my husband. We met at a company called English Electric. I was a trainee typist and he was the young executive from fresh from university. And we've now been married 52 years. I'm English. I just happen to have Chinese genetics in me. Um, I don't feel Chinese, whatever one should feel if one is Chinese. I know that I am part Chinese. 16 years. Yeah, see what's happening now, the rust. That's what Robert's going to repair, and that needs cleaning up. So when's he going to do it? He was hoping to get down before Remembrance Day. There's an expression that we used having a chip on your shoulder, and she had a chip on both shoulders. They know why she is the way she is. And it wouldn't have been nice being the way she was in Britain at the time. It was not a nice place if you weren't white. It rejected non-whites. And being brought up like that where you're different is very painful. You get the odd kids at school giving me a bit of racist remarks, but it wasn't nowhere near as bad as when I left school and started work. And I ended up working down in Birmingham because of the racism in Liverpool. <laughs> Make a living. <laughs> you should be retired. What's been going on at the pagoda? Oh, uh, nothing much. Been uh, practicing with the kids today. You missed the uh, talent show last week. Yeah, I well, wasn't invited. You were. You were coming to sing. <laughs> that means then you didn't want anyone here. <laughs> <laughs> Cheers, love. So that's your photos. That's me, father and mother. And what's this one? Did you write that? Yeah. OK. It's when I first found out about him being forcibly deported, so I thought I'd better write about it. That's, is that the only picture of your dad and your mum? Yes. I think you're more like your mum. Her mother. 
This is your granddad. Yeah. I think so, yeah. Are you three quarter? Yeah. Okay. Your father is Chinese? Yes, I mean Mozart. Your mother? Chinese English. Chinese English, right. How did you feel at the time? Do you feel like your your dad just left you? It took me a while to get used to the idea, because my father died in 1976. In fact, even when I seen my half-brother and two sisters in Singapore, they didn't even know anything about it too much. But they knew you exist? Oh, yes. They knew I existed, because they sent me a letter. Do you want to build a connection with them? Can't even find connection with my family here. So I'm sure I can't find any connection with the family over there, can I? Those families who were part of that history, um, this is live, right? And it will be the lives of their future generations. Trauma is experienced intergenerationally, so these are not things that stay in the history. They're very much alive today. Well, I remember the Lord Mayor going there in his coach. God. But when I was a kid, this whole place would be so full of people. Yes. And you know the other thing? I listen, you can't listen, it's quiet now, apart from trying, was Mahjong. Oh, God, You'd yeah. walk down and you get every, the clicking of the clicking building. in every building. This is just like when Bert Hardy, you know, took his photos, all the railings are there. And all the, you know, see the pictures with the guys, you know, they're all, they're, they're leaning on That's here right. and they're sitting yeah. on here. Yeah. Incredible suits, overcoats, the hats, you know, the fedoras, the and they were all handmade. Because they, the thing was, on the ships, the Chinese seamen were put in the worst part of the ship, yeah. usually near the engine, so yeah. it was hot and sweaty. So they basically spent their life in, you know, underpants and singlets. Yes. And they came here, got off on shore. My God, they got they dressed up to the nines. Yes. And that is a really provocative memory that yeah. I have as well. To have a good look at the Chinatown of today, we've got to come back to where it all began. I came up in 1981, right, and I made my documentary uh, about the place, and no one had ever mentioned to me about the Shanghai seamen being deported and after the war. Yeah. So I, I came back and I said, hey, guys, why didn't you mention this amazing story? Yes. And they said, because yeah. you didn't ask. Exactly. <laughs> That's what I found all the way along. It's very much, it's in the past, why bother? It was sort of not talked about and was a sort of open secret for so long. It was like a Chinese whisper. We knew it was there, but don't know why. Now derelict, this is the only remaining example of what were many such boarding houses. So, you know, when I was here in 1981, we actually went into one of the old uh, boarding houses. It was, it was a ruin. And I remember going to the door, but as soon as I walked in there, it had an incredible atmosphere. I kept saying, when my dad first came over, he must have stayed in one of these boarding Mine houses. Mine must have done. Without trying to sound too spooky, there was a real atmosphere. And when I came out, I thought, well, I, I, I've somehow touch where my dad had been. And then the next time I came back to Liverpool, I can't remember how long it was, but the building had gone. If you walk around this Chinatown, then it's really hard to think that decades ago, Chinese people were being torn away from their families because the atmosphere here is really welcoming. It's really friendly. 
But it's really striking to think that just a few generations ago, they wouldn't have been so welcome in a city like London or Liverpool. So this is an article I've actually heard quite a lot about, but never managed to see it in the flesh. It's titled, The Chinese in England, A Growing National Problem, by Herman Schaffer. So the piece is really interesting because it's one of the articles from the time that really helped to stoke this kind of racial tension between the Chinese community and the white community. And I think that it really helped to lay the groundwork for the deportations that came a few decades later. Articles like Chef Hours were enormously influential, but they, they didn't work in isolation. Chinese lurked in the darkness. Their presence meant treachery, danger, and certain death. What we get time and time again is sort of Fu Manchu figure, evil mastermind who's wanting to overtake the world, who has a particular penchant for young white women and are going to destroy Western civilization. This was picked up in movies, in fiction, the newspaper stories, in the education system. It was really pervasive and it had a very corrupting effect upon the way that British people saw the Chinese. So one of the things that jumps out to me is this persistent emphasis on Chinese blood mixing with the blood of white English women. She's saying things like, a slow, silent, but steady infiltration of Chinese has taken place. Tales are told of hideous vices, of monstrous oriental orgies, this idea that they are attacking women, that they are attacking children, they're hiding their true nature. It is just really shocking. There's also this emphasis on intermarriage and that it's kind of threatening the stability of Liverpool, that these relationships are somehow an abomination. And you can even see it in this image of this very prim and proper white English woman sort of almost touching her breast. And in the background, there's this lurking Chinese man. It's kind of shrouded in this shadow, almost as if it's this woman is being kind of like tempted into the darkness by this man. One of the things I find actually really remarkable about this article, it's really rare to see historic photos of the Chinese community in the UK. And even rarer, I think, to see photographs of mixed race, half Chinese, half white people. It's really important for people to know that Chinese people were considered part of British society, that they settled and had families, and, and yet they were so easily made to disappear as if they were worth nothing. One of the things that made the Chinese population so vulnerable is they didn't really have any allies. They're such a small group, it's almost impossible for them to fight back. Maybe this is the missing piece to my life. You're trying to complete the picture, but you don't really know what the picture is. That's exactly how I feel. My name is Barbara Ann Janacek, and I always wanted to actually change my name to Annie Ong. Ong is actually the surname of my biological father. This is my birth certificate. 1945, I was born in Liverpool, in Toxteth. My mother was a Eurasian too, which is rather unusual in that time. Here she is as a young mother, and I was about three months of age then. It's very difficult being Eurasian because I hate to say it in the sense that the Chinese too feel a little sort of like you don't quite you're not Chinese, right? So it's, you don't really belong to the Chinese world, and you cannot belong to the British world. My accent was quite British, and they'd say to me, you don't sound like that person. 
you should be like blonde haired and blue eyed. You know what I mean? I'm always sort of fighting that, that Eurasian thing. I never actually spoke to my mother about my dad. It was like an, an unwritten thing. We just thought he, he, he left us. It's the first photograph I ever saw of my father. And I was very surprised to see how tall he was. It was taken in 1943 in Liverpool. I know she was heartbroken because when my dad left, my mother did not actually know she was pregnant with my younger brother. And I don't like to say this, but she tried to have an abortion. She was so destitute, we didn't have any money. She wanted to protect us and give us a future as children. She actually married because she felt that was the right thing for her to do, to give us a better life. When we found out, and it was actually very shocking to us that these men were forced out of Britain. I know one of the other children's father had gone out to buy something and he, he never came back again. That's how it was. It was wrong. It destroyed lots of families. I, I just live with it. Because what are you going to do? I'd rather live with it than not live with it. It was important for me to, not to forget who he is. I don't know how my dad got to the UK, but I always wondered, was it out of necessity or did he have a spirit of adventure and wanted to see the world? And that's how he ended up working in the Merchant Navy. Liverpool was one of the biggest ports in the world. During the Second World War, Liverpool actually became the headquarters of convoy operations um, across the Atlantic. We know well enough that so far as the Battle of the Atlantic is being fought at sea, the Navy is there. Hundreds of ships were sunk by the Germans. Many of those lives that were lost were Chinese. My father came from China. He ended up signing on a British ship, which came to Liverpool. This is a list of ships, casualties in the Second World War. Number five, Titan. Titan bound from London to Australia via the Cape. Torpedoed and sunk whilst in convoy. Position west of Hebrides, latitude, longitude. Date, 4th of September, 1940. All members of crew saved, so my father was lucky. He said he was in the water for a short time, swimming about in the Atlantic Ocean. Then he was picked up by a Canadian warship. There wasn't a lot of dwelling on, on the danger or mental anguish or anything like that. He just got on with it. Without these mariners who were risking their lives every single day, Britain would have capitulated because they would simply have not had the food and war material to keep on fighting. Chinese seafarers were, were paid at different rates of, for doing the same work. So that unfair treatment caused additional tensions in those kind of seafaring and shipping communities. 
I would say it's about exploitation. I mean, I'm sure some of those Chinese sailors became aware that they weren't getting the same deals as their European counterparts and perhaps became more politicised and radicalised. To deal with the U-boat menace, more and more escort vessels are needed. They will help in guiding our convoys, which continue to bring us the sinews of war. The irony, of course, is that some of them were actually British subjects to shipping lines that were very well known for employing Chinese crew. Most of their recruitment was done through Hong Kong. Chinese seafarers were also recruited in Singapore. When I started to research and become involved in the story of the repatriated Chinese sailors from the 1940s, I very much felt that it was hidden history. And I think um, for me growing up as British Chinese, that's always been the case. Thousands of Chinese seamen now serving with the Allied Merchant Navy, shoulder to shoulder in the greatest battle of naval history, alongside their British seamen comrades. They too brave the torpedoes, the bombs and the mines, making history. It's interesting in the film that they were seen very much as like model citizens. They were very valued, you know, because they served a good purpose, doing very dangerous work. But of course, things changed quite drastically. The guys had fought for equal pay. They fought for the war bonus. And after the war, um, they were seen as troublemakers. They were doing the same job, and they'd suffered during the war on the ships, so they wanted to be treated that way. That's when it started to get very, very hard for them. These men are readier than ever to give back and give better than they did. As an English woman, if you married a Chinese foreigner, you were classed as an alien. And that was the law that any woman who married a non-British, you took the husband's nationality on. And most of the women didn't even know that they were alien. None of the women were able to claim benefit from social services. Then the families were destitute. And that happened more frequently when the men started to disappear. What was tragic was the, the guys who were married, the guys who had families here. They actually had a right to remain. There's a stereotype of the Chinese community, they're very quiet. So they kind of like learned to be quiet. Because look what happened to the Chinese uh, sailors just after the Second World War, when they did stick their heads up at the parapet and, you know, demand equal pay, they were dispensed of. Declassified documents are incredibly valuable in getting historical perspective on some of the darkest moments in British history. You can only hide secrets like this for so long. If you look at the Liverpool Chinese community, most of them obviously knew that something had happened to their fathers. But without archival evidence, they could only guess. They could only speculate. Home office file. 213-96. Repatriation of Chinese seamen at Liverpool. All the Chinese seamen deemed to be surplus to requirements will be asked to attend the immigration office at Liverpool. The landing conditions will be vary so as to require the man to leave by a theoretical sailing date of the ship. Right. At the end of the day, the ship will leave the dock but will wait in the river for two more days before actually sailing and the men by then are trapped on the ship. They just disappear. So they were planning and planning. It was very much a disposable workforce, and when Chinese seamen in World War II start kicking up a fuss, that makes them an undesirable workforce, especially within the Home Office, and so they do what they can to get rid of them, defining them as undesirable, as diseased, as drug addicts, and replace them with a more amenable workforce. 
What was needed was cheap labour. So they brought in Cantonese guys after they dispensed of the Shanghaiese troublemakers who had fought for their equal rights. They got rid of, what, nearly 2,800 men by March 1946. The system is working well. Deportation orders not to be made against men with British-born wives. That's not what happened, is it? They didn't tell them. A really unpleasant, unpleasant thing. It was something done in quite a matter-of-fact manner, eliminating what was seen as surplus and unwanted uh, individuals from Liverpool. Oh, look at this. By the 11th of July, nearly 5,000 men have been shipped out. Crikey. And you don't ship 5,000 men by it just happened, you go out and grab them. Yeah, so it just that, couldn't happen. Can you imagine if that had happened in that manner? This sort of myth that's created that, oh, I'll grab them all and got yeah. rid of them. You organise the ships, yes. you gather the men, you put the men on the ships, you can count them, make sure who they are, names, file, everything, and the guys yeah. go. Yeah, yeah. Gosh. There's one big myth. They rounded up all these guys, took them out to ships, and they were stuffed in the hold, which was complete nonsense. The whole thing is dealt with in a very British way. How do we get rid of the rest? Easy. We alter the landing conditions, and they can no longer be ashore. Uh, we, we require them to be on the boat at such and such a date. After the war, we'll ship them back, and we won't sign them on again. A lot of people have a very visceral sort of view of police kicking down doors, grabbing people off of their bids. But what the, the documents show us was really a sort of banality of evil, a banality of bureaucracy. There was no humanity involved in these sorts of decisions that were being made. So we are reminded about the callousness of the British Empire, about the lack of care that it had for its subjects. 117 of the Chinamen had British-born wives. Many of their wives were of the prostitute class and would not wish to accompany their husbands to China. Mm. To imply that my mother was a prostitute, it really, really got me angry. Seeing that in black and white and thinking, how dare you, how dare you treat all the women like that? But it certainly shows a very, very sad and disgusting story. And their suffering duly needs to be told and acknowledged, and there needs to be a proper apology for that. You had their wives writing into the newspapers and saying, there's something going on, we need to find our husbands. Um, but for many working class families, um, you're not heard by those um, in power. Uh, and these are stories that are better left uncovered, so a sense of, well, we don't talk about that. I think for a lot of the women, when the men disappeared, they had no choice but to get on with the life. And in not a lot of cases, it wasn't a nice one, but they had no choice. It was an awful thing to happen, and, it, and a lot of people suffered. It was hard for me um, in the sense that it's not just Ivan which makes it hard enough. Um, there's my, my mother-in-law. When it came to her turn for, for us to tell her, she wasn't around. And we, we know it would have helped her, but she was, it was too late, she was gone. My father came to Singapore in 1934. He became a seaman and he traveled around the world and landed up in Liverpool. He been there for eight years. He get to know Peter's mother. They were together and uh, as a result, Peter was born. My father, he was just a seaman as far as I know. And that's all there is that I can say about him. 
deported in 46. So I'd have been two year old then. My mother didn't even know that he'd been deported. Even to this day, she just thought he left her. My father did not talk about his life in Liverpool. And we actually got to know about my brother through a relative in Singapore. We just accepted, and not long after we knew the whole thing, he passed away. Then in 1980, I was given an opportunity to go to UK. And while I was in London, I thought maybe I should try to find out how to locate my brother. My colleague in London gave me the Liverpool telephone book and there were four Peter Fools listed in the book. The fourth one was actually my brother. So that's how we established communication. Met together with the family. And when I look at him, I say, oh, so you look, you look like me. It was funny. The both of us look quite alike, and we were just like old friends, and uh, we just ch ch chit chat. It was just enjoyable to meet up with him, and um, I had my wife and a uh, couple of kids with me. I just enjoyed it. That's all I can say. In the late nineties, Peter tell me that uh, my father was actually the bought that out of Liverpool because they were considered to be illegal immigrants. Peter went through a very tough life when he was young. And all these years, he was very frustrated as he thought that the father dumped them in Liverpool and ran away after the war. So I think that disturbed him a lot. And he walked through his entire life that way. Probably look on life and see all, only the bad side of life. Because not knowing me, Father, look at the things I've missed out on. I've missed out on a lot of things in life. I feel sorry for Peter. And I hope to see him again. How did it affect me? It's not a simple answer. But the decisions I made in my life had a lot to do with my father leaving. I think I was just 19 when I eloped and left Liverpool. And the man I married was 18 years older than I. So I feel in some ways I was looking for some father figure, someone I could feel protected by, loved by, cared by. Just after my mother died in the 1970s, a chap came into my brother's business and said to my brother, your dad knows all about you. He knows all about your older brother and he even knows where your sister lives. And my brother said, look, my dad deserted us. I don't want any to know anything about him. And he asked him to leave. So I found out about this and I was very upset because I felt it was a great, probably the greatest opportunity in my life to reconnect with, with my dad. I think he was reaching out to us. I've been, what, 35 years looking for my dad to the point of being insane like phoning up people who I thought may have been him, looking through a direct reason, asking, do you know a person of that name? Charles. 
Jaws? Yeah. Come and have a look at this. My father, oh. he stayed with the girl. He knew a girl in Liverpool, yeah. a British girl. He was in... I think he was close together with her parents. Please note that these stories are passed yeah. down, which yeah. is like all of us, isn't it? So Kenneth Young is a gentleman who made contact with me, referring to the fact that my family name would have been Young, or from my Shanghai father, and his family name is Young, which is fascinating because this is the first time I've come across a Young uh, that is a seaman as well, and that has been in Liverpool. It's an opportunity to find out. I don't mind at all. Quite pleased with the idea of trying to get to Singapore and meet up. It could be a cousin, could be anybody. We don't know, but we'll find out if we can. Yeah, now, these are all from Singapore. Oh, OK. This is your great-granddad. This is the wife, and that's the mother. And these are the kids in Singapore. Wow. They are. Have that's a look at that. It's proper nice, that. It's like got like a little like, separate family. <laughs> it's lovely, that. Thomas is there. So that's Thomas in the middle at the front there, yeah, isn't that, it? That yeah. was Thomas. I wonder if there's any like other people within the family there that are like more like around like my age as well. It's only when we go to uh, go to Singapore and find yeah, out. Find out. Kenneth Young is a gentleman who made contact with me. My family name would have been Young from my Shanghai father, and his family name is Young. And that's not something that I've found before. I've found different variations of Young, but nothing as definite as this. He's come out of the background of this great miasma of uh, deported seamen, but uh, we've never come across anything like him before. For me, if she finds that he's a half-brother, uh, I don't know how she'll react, because she generally hides her feelings. But we'll find out soon enough. Hello, you are. We met. Hello, we, we, met we met by the way. Yeah, cousin. Have a seat. Thank you, thank you. Everything fine, Singapore? Uh, yes, just Paul. Not used to it. <laughs> it's really nice. Yeah. After all this time. Yeah, we start off from an uh, email in May. Yeah. Now we meet each other. I screamed. Charles, come and have a look at this. You've got to read it. You've got to read it. I have something to show you. You remember the copy I sent over to you? I think it's the oh, original. Oh, yeah. the original. It's my father's passport. Oh, that's amazing. Oh, look My at that. father, when he was 21, the family name Y-O-U-N-G, yeah. Gosh. It's just so amazing to see it because nowhere else has it come across. Oh, no, not yeah. It's always Y-U, Y-N. Y-E-O, Y-U-N-G. Yes. He was born in 1937. Now, that's, that's where he came from. Zhejiang, which is um, a, a poem uh, next to Shanghai. Wow, that's where Mum said my, my father was from. There's so many similarities that we've got. This was taken in Hong Kong, I think, oh. 1963. My father has more than one time mentioned his uh, past relationship with a British girl at Danny in Liverpool. In hindsight, I think, you know, that may be an underlying message from my father. That is another reason why I want to go further. At least I can answer the call from my father. 
I suppose the idea of it all, if we consider it, to try and do a DNA test. I'm more than happy. I yeah. think at least in a way, it, it gives you an answer of, of something yeah. which you have been yes. pursuing yeah. for so yeah. long. So if it's a half brother, it'll be terrific. <laughs> yeah. Well, I can give the orders. <laughs> in a way. <laughs> Yvonne's case shows how DNA is really a game changer. In the absence of archival records, or where the archival records are fragmented, like in much of Asian immigration history, DNA can potentially open new doors to people, to cities, and to even countries that we may not have imagined would have been in our family history. Two decades of research that you have contributed to? Yes. I didn't set out to find my father. Because in all truth, I didn't think he'd be alive or we stood a dog in hell's chance of doing so. I was surprised at the amount of effort, and I'm, I'm sure the time and the, the cost of it, you know, the psychological effects of it, it's quite traumatic to think about. In a search for proof about an event that may or may not have happened, one should never give up. And Yvonne, as well as the other Liverpool children, have demonstrated the value in persisting in resilience, in overcoming what is an incredibly emotionally difficult subject for them to try and keep that topic alive and to try and seek answers. felt really intimidated looking at this landscape. Totally foreign yet familiar, yeah. because he obviously would have seen this place on a ship, but arriving in a very different situation and circumstance. Yeah. This is the official seafront of Singapore to ships coming in. In the distance, you will see Clifford Pier. If you could just close your eyes and reimagine 70 years ago, none of this existed. If your father had been deported here, that's where he would have landed from the ship, if mm. his ship was at anchor here. Mm. And never been able to go back yeah. to then think, well, what am I going to do? And he's got to try and make a life here. I can't imagine what it was like. You've been so long at sea, you're worrying about your future. You're just going to be happy to get off the boat and try and sort something out. Or you're going to feel anger, resentment, anxiety. I should think if my father, I would think it was anger. Very much, I know, from my own personality. And if that's the case, then he'd be feeling very frustrated and angry and annoyed and wanting to know why. As a seaman, you don't need a passport when you travel. Yeah. But after that, when he after that, Singapore, he would have needed. Yeah, he would have had to have one then. Then that should be the, the Hong Kong British passport. Given how many you know Liverpool Chinese sailors were deported to Singapore, this actually opens up a really interesting question: How many of them actually started families in Singapore? How many Singaporeans may have had this aspect of history that they didn't know existed? You could be talking about several thousand Singaporeans who have this family history but just don't really know about it. We, we have some internal discussion. If we pronounce it in the dialect, my father speaks Shanghainese, everything, it really, really sort of like a matching because if, if we make it in Shanghainese, it will be in nine. The most important thing, we proofread his email. I hope the email came across nicely. <laughs> proofread the email, right? But anyway, he, he was... He's my proof. <laughs> it's been so great to meet you. Um, Me too. I'm heading home tonight, but it's no matter what the results are, I feel it's fantastic that I've met you. Yeah, whatever the result, yeah. negative, positive, yeah. I'm happy. Yeah, and I feel, you know, it's like gain, gaining some another relative anyway. It's still open, isn't it? It's, it's, it'll still be open.
we're reaching a final stage in terms of like we've done as much as we can and somebody else wants to take it on. We wanted to get the information out there and I think we've achieved that and that's give us both great satisfaction. Really, really happy to be part of your, your story. I didn't find my father physically, but mentally I found him within my own nature. And really, that's all I can say. Whichever country I go to, I always gravitate to, to the ocean. I love the ocean. And, I, and then I think about my father and I think, I wonder, did you go to sea because you love the ocean so much? Did you love to be on the sea? It's such a puzzle. You know, it's a puzzle where you can't find the pieces. You can't complete this puzzle, right? I'm getting very old now. Will I know anything more? Before I die, I, I don't know. I'm thinking of my mother. I'm thinking of my mother's spirit. Yeah. And of course, I'm thinking of my father too. Right? It's the letter. The letter. Okay. <laughs> okay. So, DNA test report, Yvonne Foley and Kenneth Young. Based on testing results obtained from analysis of the DNA... Oh! Lab test listed. Oh, the, the probability of half-siblings is 0.1%. The likelihood that they do not share a common biological parent is, wow, look at that, <laughs> a thousand, a thousand and ninety-one to one. Oh. oh, that's a shame. Right. It's sad, really, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. At least it was worth it. <laughs>